Hello everyone and welcome to season four of The Next Show. Hey everyone, great to see you again. We have a fantastic speaker lineup. Today we're going to have a great speaker from Canada. Yes, indeed. Our guest this week is Alexandra deschamps Sonsino, and Alex is here to talk to us about the Internet of Things, how it will reshape the world around us in the coming decades, and also how you can build a great culture of innovation inside your organization. So I cannot wait to hear from Alex. And we invited her and several other guests in connection to our theme for the next conference this year, Hug the System. We want to discuss topics all in connection with systems, systems that help or hinder us, systems that we want to overcome or change from the within. And you want to share a thought about these systems with us before we dive into the conversation with Alexandra. Yes, I do. I saw a great story a couple of weeks ago that really piqued my interest when it comes to systems thinking. And let me share that with you right now. Looking forward to learning more about that. This is a thought about remote work and innovation. So two years into the pandemic, I'm still thinking and I'm still talking about one of my great obsessions and that's innovation and remote and hybrid work. The big question is, can teams and organizations be as innovative and as creative in a world when they don't spend that much time together in a room in real life? Can they be innovative and creative in a remote and hybrid work world? And that question is underpinned by long-standing research on what makes innovation possible, what fuels an innovative culture. So one of the pieces of evidence that I'm obsessed with is this landmark paper published in 2012 in the Harvard Business Review. It's called The Science of What Makes Great Teams. And these researchers found that innovative cultures are fueled by something very particular. They're fueled by a constant stream of informal communication, informal chit chat between colleagues. This is communication that's very unstructured, it's very casual, doesn't happen in meetings, it's not governed by the manager, so no one is afraid of saying something stupid or wrong. That's the kind of communication these researchers found that fuels creativity and innovation. And it just seems to me that that is exactly the type of communication we lose in a remote and hybrid work world. Instead, so much communication becomes highly structured. It happens over video calls where people take turns to speak and the manager is controlling everything and people are frightened of saying something wrong or saying something stupid. And that is a real problem for innovation and creativity. Now there is a new paper just published in the research journal Nature that tends to lend credence to this, the idea that remote and hybrid work makes innovation more difficult. These researchers at Columbia and Stanford did something really interesting. So they gathered about 1,500 engineers from a US multinational company. They put these engineers into pairs and asked them simply to brainstorm new ideas. And what they found is that the engineers that worked via video call had fewer ideas and less creative ideas as judged by an independent panel than the engineers who worked face to face. Okay, so again, lending credence to this idea that remote and hybrid work hampers creativity. There's all kinds of evidence on this front. Microsoft just last year gathered data from 30,000 of its employees working remotely across Microsoft Teams. And what they found is that their workers working remotely had far less communication amongst themselves, far less communication between teams. And the idea again is that this can be damaging for innovation. There were limitations to that Microsoft study. So that data was from the very early days of the pandemic when people had yet to get used to remote work. They hadn't been able to adapt very much. But still, you put all this evidence together and it is very troubling for organizations, especially large organizations that want to be innovative but are now working with remote work or hybrid work models. Look, there are some people that are very opposed to this idea that you can't be creative, you can't be innovative via the remote or hybrid work world. They think that this is an outdated idea. I just think that we don't know yet. I think the question is unanswered. And I think we need to see two big things, lots more studies at an even greater scale to gather evidence about what remote and hybrid work is doing 
to creativity and innovation. And I also think we're going to see a massive wave of innovation. So we're going to see new platforms, new tools that are all about promoting informal communication and new kinds of meetings, spontaneous meetings and random conversations between colleagues to fuel creativity. The, we'll see the emergence of what I call a chit-chat economy. We need tools and platforms that fuel new kinds of chat among colleagues. So watch out for those two things, more evidence, new tools and platforms. And this is for sure something that we'll be talking with our guests about in this season. I am delighted to welcome to this episode of The Next Show our superstar guest, Alexandra deschamps Sonsino. Alex is an author, consultant and entrepreneur who spent 15 years thinking about the Internet of Things. She's the founder of the Low Carbon Design Institute. She's the author of books Creating an Innovative Culture in 2020 and Smarter Homes in 2018. And she is the founder of the Internet of Things Meetup in my hometown, London. We are delighted to welcome her to the next show. Alex, welcome to the show. How are you? Thank you so much for having me. I'm super well, thank you. Thanks for joining us. Okay, we have a lot to talk about because you have a very diverse portfolio of work. So I am excited to do a little bit of technology thinking, a little bit of technology philosophizing, and also draw out some implications of your work and your fascinating thinking for the audience out there, the professionals that we have tuning in. But let's start with a technology trend, if you want to put it that way, that you know extremely well because you've been spending a lot of your life thinking about it for the last 15 years, the Internet of Things. You were super early, I think I'm right in saying, to the Internet of Things. I mean, you were, you've been thinking about it and talking about it since at least 2011. Where do you think we are now with that technology trend and how has it evolved and what are the current big issues in the Internet of Things from your perspective? Well, I actually um, came up with the idea for my product, The Goodnight Lamp. I know we'll talk about it later on uh, in 2005. So wow. I've been thinking about this for uh, an awfully long time. Um, I uh, think where we are now is a sort of um, more muted, uh, I suppose, point in uh, both time and technology in general, but also in this particular sector. Uh, which is that uh, the sector is growing up and it's growing up and it's also, I think, um, experiencing a plateau of disillusionment. Um, I know you'll be familiar with. Uh, and uh, I think it's a really interesting point. Um, there's a lot of appetite, I think, still for uh, things that are connected to the internet that are not traditionally um, screen-based devices, uh, but there is also a huge amount of worry, um, I would say, both on the um, surveillance side of things and also on the ecological side of things. So those two things, I think, put a lot of pressure on the sector, they put a lot of pressure on founders, and they put a lot of pressure um, on people's expectations and consumer expectations. So I think we're in a sort of point of growing up, let's say, as a sector in general. Yes, and there's a lot in all of that that I want to talk about, especially, you know, the concerns around privacy and the concerns around the climate and the planet, which I know you've thought a lot about. During my research for this conversation, I was fascinated to discover some of your thinking around the origins of the Internet of Things and the way our thinking of the home as a kind of factory has shaped the way we think about our homes and about the place of connected objects in them. Talk, talk to us a little bit about that, because it's such an intriguing idea that I hadn't encountered before. Well, I wrote Smarter Homes um, out of, I think, a desire to understand whether the Internet of Things was in fact something that was new or actually an extension of trying to sell people new technologies in a home context. It's always easier to sell someone a new technology in um, the place that they spend more time in and that they're more open to, which is their home, rather than in a business context where people get a little bit more uh, flustered, the expectations are multiple because you have to convince your boss to do something or do something differently for an organization. So both gas and electricity, for example, were really pioneered inside people's homes as opposed to citywide 
installations. Um, and so I was really interested in the connection between older technology because, you know, gas, electricity, those kinds of things we now take for granted um, and how they connect to how we sell new technologies like the Internet of Things to people today. And so I took the home as a sort of uh, laboratory, factory um, system where people were really trying to cram in as much new technology as possible and the mechanisms that they used in order to sell those technologies. Um, I think the home as a factory is a um, an extension of trying to conceptualize the home as a system. I think it doesn't actually work as a system at all. It is not a system, uh, but we in the technology space, in the engineering space, in the you know the kind of uh, startup community, uh, like to think of things in systems, and so we think that when we're selling something to uh, a person who happens to be a homeowner or um, rents, that they're uh, that we're selling them a system of sorts, and the average consumer doesn't understand their life and their life in the home as a system at all, and so there's this interesting conundrum where we keep selling people things uh, within a framework, a mental framework that doesn't actually fit their lives, which is also partly why some of the Internet of Things pioneers that have been emerging over the last 20 years um, have failed over and over again. Yeah, and this kind of reminds me a bit of, a, of a, another trend that I feel like we talked a lot about kind of five, ten years ago, and maybe we don't talk about it so much now because it's so mainstream, a bit like the Internet of Things, it's so mainstream, it's starting to sort of fade into the background. But the quantified self and the way that covering your body with sensors or carrying sensors in the form of a phone or wearable device um, allows brands to sell you this vision of optimization, like self-optimization and efficiency that perhaps isn't really it doesn't really chime with the way most people think about their lives or want to think about their lives and it sounds like you think that there's a there's a danger to a certain extent that that the internet of things comes from a similar place sort of imposing structures of efficiency on users that that they're perhaps not ready to embrace or quite legitimately willing to embrace well i think it's um down to every single person to decide when technology becomes useful for themselves but not necessarily um, you know, the idea of selling someone something that makes them more effective and more efficient is something that harks back to uh, selling people, you know, better laid out kitchens. Um, and so, and I talk about that in my book a lot uh, because um, some of the early pioneers in even kitchen interior design talked about the efficient household. Um, and the efficient, the idea of efficiency, efficiency in your life, efficiency with every single run that you take or cycle that you make or um, you know every single physical activity you can have as contributing not only to your own efficiency but the efficiency of services around you um, there's a lot of breakage in that efficiency there's a lot of you know uh, abuse of that efficiency as well people can bet can get really kind of addicted to that piece of information or fake it entirely because they know that it occupies um, and it allows them to have different perks. So way before wearables, people used to log into their local um, gym, uh, you know, come in, put a towel in uh, the locker room and then log back out again because they knew that them just going to the gym would reduce their insurance premiums. And so that was without <laughs> any, you know, wearable involved at all. But people knew that there were systems of quote unquote surveillance um, that uh, that they could game. And people have done that with wearables, they've done that with other kinds of devices. Uh, just because you buy a technology does not mean that the person who is buying it is uh, buying it for the purposes that you intend as, a, uh, as an entrepreneur. And so, yeah, the, there's a lot of complications in that space and it becomes complicated very quickly. Again, because people don't uh, live in a factory setting and they don't live factory lives. Yeah, and it's, it's amazing how as soon as you establish, I mean, that gym story is brilliant. It's amazing how as soon as you establish metrics or you make something measurable, you produce all kinds of behaviours that you never intended to produce. And people find crazy ways of gaming the system, especially if you, especially if you start to establish incentives like, uh, you know, money off your insurance. I mean, I don't know if people are going to start trying to game their smart fridge and kind of trick their fridge into thinking they're not eating as much chocolate or whatever as they might be. But yeah, I mean, 
you know, we've talked a, quite a bit there about um, some of the dangers of the Internet of Things for users or some of the ways the Internet of Things wants to impose on users kind of structures and ways of being that, 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 that they're perhaps not, you know, to the greatest advantage of the user. But it's clear from your work you also see, or well, you tell me, I mean, you also see immense potential for good in the Internet of Things. And I think this is where, you know, you can tell us more about your, your good night lamp and that feels to me a project in demon, partly a project in demonstrating that the Internet of Things can support human ways of being, right? Yeah, and, and I mean, let's be also very clear, which is that the Internet of Things is a um, very large community of entrepreneurs trying to sell things in a marketplace that is very difficult to sell in, which is the consumer space. It's extremely aggressive. It's extremely competitive. And people have ideas that they're trying to fit into people's lives. Sometimes that has, you know, positive consequences. I'd like to think as, of the goodnight lamp as a a sort of benign and very warm idea. Um, you know, I came up with it in 2005 as a design student. Uh, it was a very different space. It was a very different information space as well. Um, and uh, it's still, you know, something I'm extremely proud of. But since then, of course, the information space that we have, we're talking on, you know, I'm talking to you on a platform, on a laptop with my phone next to me. Um, with, you know, many other devices around me. I think there's about 16 different Wi-Fi networks around this <laughs> right. house. Um, it, the space is completely different and people's interactions with their worlds, with their family life, with information is different. And so I don't think that there's any such thing as a sort of good trend, bad trend, and that in general people are trying to do more harm than before, but things are changing and uh, people's expectations of what they can or can't do with the device are also changing. And I think anything with the screen, which is a mobile phone, which obviously smartphones came in after I created the goodnight lamp, um, Wi-Fi coverage has increased massively. We have 5G now, 6G in development. Um, we have an information space that allows people to do completely different things and therefore entrepreneurs to create completely different solutions. Um, how they're accepted by people and how sticky they become in people's lives is always the question and it's always the entrepreneurial question. Um, but I think that people are much more technology literate than they were 20 years yeah, ago. They're also yeah. much more... Um, worried about the consequences of what is happening to the data that might be produced by a device, that might be produced by a service. Where is it stored? How does GDPR play into this? If there is GDPR at all? Um, yeah, it's it becomes a, a lot more of a complicated question with the consumer than when I created the Goodnight Lamp. And just for viewers who don't know or haven't seen it, describe the Goodnight Lamp and what it does for them. So the Goodnight Lamp is a family of lamps. You have a big lamp and little lamps. You give the little lamps away to anybody around the world. And when you turn the big lamp on, the little ones turn on. So a very simple way of saying, you know, now's a good time to chat. Um, we've had a lot of uh, multi-generational families kind of uh, use it. So a grandparent can call a grandchild just before bedtime to tell them a story. Um, people use it to say, you know, I'm thinking of you, I love you. Um, and this uses, um, you know, at the time we were using 2G, uh, which it has been, you know, subsumed by a number of different Gs since. Yes. Um, and uh, really very much the focus was no matter what your technology is set up at home, if you could receive a text message, that means you've got 2G in your area, so it should work. Um, and so, yeah, really a, a product of its time and its technological space as well. Yeah, and it's, a, it's just a, a lovely, simple way of establishing a human connection. It feels to me with other people around the world, you know, loved ones around the world who are not sort of physically proximate, but it's just that little touch point. Like you say, I mean, it feels a product now when you talk about it that way, you know, 2005, I think you said, and 2G. Um, yeah, I mean, we're in such a different place now when it comes to connected objects in our home. Um, I want to talk a bit about two of the big things. Well, w one big thing we've already touched on privacy and, and uh, um, the relationship there with another huge development when it comes to connected objects in our home, and that's voice. I mean, I think for most people, voice assistants, right, are the sort of predominant, would you agree, the predominant way that they 
they interact with and think about, you know, connected objects in their home now. I mean, I, you know, we have Alexa at home and children are constantly talking to it and it recognises all of our voices and, and all of that. I mean, voice has been a huge development, right? Well, I think it's been a huge um, development in progress. I mean, I think we have the um, visually impaired community to really thank for this because their use of voice activated everything uh, has been going on since the 80s. And so that technology that was useful to people who you know needed that voice replacement for a visual interface uh, became something that started building up um, and is now... I think the latest data is something like 25% of American homes have a voice activated device of some kind. Um, I'm also really intrigued by the fact that the usage is extremely limited. So the top three apps are always the same top three apps, which is something like a timer, um, you know, the weather and or traffic uh, and something else I'm not even remembering now. Um, and I think that that is a really interesting example of a something you kind of experiment with. You sort of think, well, I'm going to buy a little bit of the future. I can buy a smart television and I kind of know what a television is from the last, you know, 80 years of what televisions are, but this I'm not quite sure. Let's try it out. And I think this let's try it out was um, really rendered very easy by a very, very low um, price point for what it is technologically speaking. Um, it's quite an advanced technology, but, you know, available in a shape that was extremely cheap to manufacture. I mean, the um, first Echoes and the first, you know, all of these devices were very, very easy to mold in terms of plastics and um, in terms of mass manufacturing. And it becomes something that's easy for someone to adopt. Um, and when I say adopt, I don't mean just in terms of technological, technological adoption, but also adoption as one would adopt a pet. It's something you kind of grow with as a family, as you describe, you know, having people kind of go and make space for this kind of interaction, make, make space for exploring in the same way that you would have bought an Ibo 20 years ago from Sony and just played around with this sort of, you know, robotic dog and just experimented right. what was possible, what was annoying, what wasn't. Um, so I think it's it's been extremely successful for that reason, because that adoption process was so easy. So I have a couple of questions. I mean, a couple of big questions. A few years ago, you know, there was an idea that voice could become the primary way we interact with, you know, the internet, the primary way that we are online, if you want to think about it that way. Do you think that that can happen or is going to happen? And the other big thing, I mean, and let's take these in turn. The other big thing I want to talk about is even if, you know, adoption of voice gets significantly higher than it does now, it doesn't have to become the primary way we interact with the Internet. What does that mean for businesses and brands? How do you make sense of being a brand if people are doing a lot of their commerce, a lot of their retail via voice? It feels that that kind of is an end to some extent of brands as we know them. You know, if I'm saying to Alexa, oh, order me some washing powder, you know, you know, sort me out with a bank account. It just feels like brand, the chance brands have to present themselves to me as a customer radically change and are radically limited, essentially. Would you agree? Uh, yes, I also think that that is, um, there's two assumptions here, one which is that people want to do a lot more vocalizing um, of just about everything. And I think that we, uh, I don't know how old your children are or um, right. kids around you. Yeah. And so, um, you know, there's a point at which that uh, I, if I look at my 11 and 13 year old nieces and nephews, uh, there's nothing being said whatsoever. <laughs> um, you know, how are you fine is what you're going to get from them. And because I think that that um, text based, chat based, um, app based communication layer is also uh not only easier for some people, but also um, much more, um, much less emotive. If we assume that we're going to interact with the internet via voice, we're also assuming that we're ready to vocalize search in a completely different way. And we're ready to vocalize searches that we might not be comfortable saying out loud. And so I think we have to kind of question 
where a brand-based search or brand-based vocal interaction stays within the context of um, social life? Um, are we assuming that most people's uh, voice interactions are going to happen um, in solitude? Uh, because, you know, most of the things that you and I search for, whether we're shopping or whether we're looking for medical services, would we ever say those things out loud? You know, show me red shoes. Um, would we say it that way? Would we vocalize that search that way? I'm not sure. And I also think that for brands, it's an absolute catastrophe because it requires someone to uh, firstly remember the brands that they interact with, right. which sometimes they don't. You're, you know, sometimes you're like washing powder. What was that one? The one with the white and green one, you know, the big box I usually buy. And so then you're asking an algorithm to make an educated, quote unquote, historic decision on what your choices might be, um, is that a uh, neutral way of shopping? Because you might actually be losing out on promotions that are happening that week in your local shops, etc. Um, and so I think that it it actually limits a consumer experience much more than it necessarily opens it up. It might make it faster to reorder, um, which is certainly what the uh, Amazon Dash buttons used to do. They used to be these little physical buttons that they sold that would just let you press a brand that you had already reordered and would just reorder it. Um, and you know, that wasn't necessarily a commercial success because the idea that you might want to just be married to this brand forever and ever has its limitations. It also, again, doesn't show you the cheapest possible option today. It just shows you what you have experience of shopping for. And people are unpredictable and like their unpredictability. Right. So it sounds like you're skeptical that voice can become the primary way that we're online but perhaps we'll have just sort of a broader, more complex ecosystem because I'm definitely not doing most of my Google searches and my sort of retail via voice, trying to scream over my children in my living room. It's just not going to work, right? I don't, I don't, I don't buy that. I don't see that happening. And, and if you don't, if I may, um, and you're a parent, you basically dictate 90% of most major corporations' income. Right. Wow. And so, I feel powerful. Uh, you know, uh, Johnson and Johnson, I believe, um, their market is a predominantly women, no matter what category of product uh, that they buy, and they tend to be mothers, and they tend to be, you know, very busy mums with a huge ecosystem of brands who are trying to scream at them continuously. Um, and if they decide to get off the horse on a particular brand or decide politically to move away from a particular brand, it's a catastrophe. So if, um, you know, parents decide to invest in particular sets of technologies, it really works out yeah. uh, because no one else has that kind of buying power. So it sounds like if you're, a prof if you're a marketing professional in our audience and you're thinking about the emergence of voice as a channel, you know, see it as one among many channels, you know, part of a complex ecosystem, maybe don't buy this idea that it's going to be the predominant or only channel. Um, maybe there was a tie. It felt like Amazon kind of wanted that a few years ago. Maybe they've, maybe they've realized it's not going to work out. I don't know. What do you, what's your feeling about it? What does Jeff Bezos want to happen to voice <laughs> in your I view? I mean, I think they've been extremely interested in, uh, you know, kooky ways of um, existing in people's homes. My favorite one um, was the Look camera, which uh, was supposed to, you know, watch you and make comments on your wardrobe choices, <laughs> which I was just sort of cringing when I saw that idea. Um, but I think that their interest wanes very, very quickly. If they don't see success within three, four months, they kill the product line within a year, which is extremely aggressive. And I don't know that it allows people to necessarily have the chance to experiment all that much and again, adopt. And I think people have adopted um, at least uh, whatever, you know, brands of home assistance because they've been hearing about it over and over again for close to 10 years now. Um, and I think that leaving things kind of sit there quietly in the background uh, to, you know, exist in people's homes is something most corporations are not ready to do. They're not ready to just sit there, pump out hardware, probably at a loss, um, just to see what happens. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, the, I, the one I love, I, I think was last year, was the Amazon Astro robot, this little home mm. robot that kind of roams around your house, essentially just looking at you. 
Um, I don't want to use the word spy, but kind of spying on you a little bit uh, and seeing the ways you behave and listening to what you're saying. And then I'm sure at some point is going to start spouting product recommendations, which leads me on to, and I mean, we could spend the rest of the day talking about this and obviously we can't sadly, but we're going to need new <laughs> privacy frameworks for this, right? I mean, how far along are we in terms of getting to grips in a regulatory sense with the Internet of Things and this constant stream of personal data from people's homes, including voice data, including, you know, your children marching around the house saying God knows what. It feels to me we're not very far along. Do you hold out much hope that we can get a grip on this from a regulatory perspective? Or maybe you think regulation isn't the answer or isn't needed. Where are you at with all of this? Well, there's a, a lot of really interesting work that's been happening um, at the intersection between um, data protection laws and consumer protection laws, because you have a device that you've bought that happens to have a, you know, 30 day, you can return this item anytime kind of protection, which this should function within a certain period of time. This should be maintained in a certain way. Ideally, this is repairable, which is where right to repair campaigning kind of happens. And then you get data protection, which is what happens to the data that's being collected over the lifetime of this particular product. And I think the Internet of Things sadly sits between those kinds of those two sectors of uh, legal and those two legal frameworks. Um, there's something called Secure by Design, which is um, a series of uh, attempts to tell people how to design connected objects, especially written uh, by the UK government. And that is really an interesting uh, attempt to just sort of pick at one of the problems. Um, as a community with the Internet of Things meetup that I ran for nine years, we created something called Better IoT. Better IoT was a questionnaire that you uh, could put in front of an entrepreneur, in front of a product manager, in front even of someone who had something that was really established on the market to ask them questions around privacy, around governance, around um, life cycle of that product, etc. Um, and so... I think that there's a lot being done. I just think it happens to sit between two layers of um, the law. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I endlessly get asked by clients and audiences about privacy, data privacy. You know, as soon as you start to talk about technology that involves streams of personal data, the first question you get in the audience, the hand shoots up. You know, what about privacy? Um, you know, a consumer's going to put up with this. <sighs> Do you get a sense that consumers, that users out there care as much as people like us, as technologists and technology thinkers, about their data privacy? Because it kind of feels like they don't care that much sometimes, right? You know, millions of people have put these devices in their home. No one reads the 50,000 page like disclaimer that you click yes on, you know, when you, when you use this stuff. Are we overthinking it? You know, or is there some kind of privacy moment coming where people truly start to care and protect their data privacy? I think everyone cares when there's um, a reason to care. So as soon as someone is in a situation that uh, whether that's domestic abuse on one end, and there are some really wonderful people doing work on the Internet of Things and domestic abuse situations to um, someone, you know, stealing your data then suddenly you need all of the frameworks there for you. And GDPR, you know, being one of the strongest that we have, it annoys everyone to think of these things as being a potential problem until there is a problem and they have the tools at their disposal. So I don't think that it helps us to say, well, this is just a sort of modern anxiety. I think it's an anxiety that is there uh, with the average consumer when they need it, when they need to be anxious about it, because something has happened. And I think that we have uh, around the world a variety of legal frameworks and a variety of legal approaches. Uh, but no one, I think, is necessarily uh, thinking about that when they buy their product, but they're happy that those legal frameworks are there when something happens. Yeah. OK, look, I'm going to wrap this up in a few minutes and move to the next segment of the show. Before we do, you took, I'm guessing, you know, two decades of technology thinking and innovation thinking and uh, running your meetup about the Internet of Things in London uh, and put a lot of that into this book that you wrote 
back in 2020 about building innovative cultures. And this was a look at how organizations can, you know, can fuel innovation, can build an innovative culture, which is something we talk about all the time here on the next show. It's a difficult question, but in, in uh, you know, the two or three minutes we have left, what were your big findings? How, how can organizations build that kind of innovative culture? And where do they often go wrong? Because I know that part of, part of your thinking in the book is that organizations often sabotage their own innovation. Well, um, the book was really about um, building, it was called, you know, creating a culture of innovation. And cultures of innovation, I think, are uh, built as a combination of what you do with people, how you trust them, and the spaces you put them in. And I really was very curious about the spaces you put people in. And those are physical spaces, digital spaces, psychological spaces, um, and the space that you allow them for new ideas, like the Internet of Things, like others. Um, and so the conclusion for me is really that um, it doesn't matter what kind of space you put someone in, whether you've created a research center um, in the middle of nowhere or a urban you know, R&D center showcase space, if people are really miserable in your organization, they will not come up with great ideas and it will not stick around. Uh, that, if you, if you will, is the tagline. And I use a lot of different physical spaces as an example. Um, and so, yeah, that, that would be the strap line for the book. Alex, if you're in the business of thinking about the future as we are, then it's always fun and sometimes good for a laugh to sort of go back and look at how people imagined the future back in the 50s, back in the 60s. It feels like we're right now kind of still in the thrall of some of those futuristic imaginings. They clearly helped shape the moment we're in. Equally, the way we're imagining the future now will shape the actual future we get decades from now. But it sometimes feels, and there are a number of thinkers who you know, argue that there's a, there's a paucity of imagining alternate futures, that it's hard for us to imagine futures that are outside the bounds of the systems and structures, and I'm thinking about capitalism primarily, that we have now. What do you think about all of that? Because I know you've written on this before. How can we imagine our ways to better futures is my final and highly philosophical question to end on. It's a great question, and um, I'm running out of laptop batteries. I'm going to answer quickly. Uh, I think that um, two areas that are worth looking into if you're looking at other kinds of ideas is to move away from space age um, type thinking into uh, both solar punk and Afrofuturism. Those are two areas that I think are really interesting. Lots of people who are way better at this than I am um, write about these kinds of imaginings and write about these kinds of visions and um, they're much more grounded in the now, they're much more grounded in um, caring as a structure as opposed to uh, conquest and discovery, which is highly colonial. Uh, and so I think that those are areas that are worth uh, looking into uh, to just move beyond um, invading things. Great. So look, if you're tuning in out there and you want to bring new visions of the future to your organization, visions that your colleagues haven't seen before, solar punk Afro futures are two great places to look. Alexandra deschamps Sonsino, do not go anywhere. This has been fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing your thinking with us. There is just one more thing we are going to do before we leave. Okay, Alex, imagine this. It is the near future. There is an acute crisis on planet Earth, not so hard to imagine these days. And amid that crisis, a crack team of technologists hatches a daring plan to launch a new chapter for humanity. Together with 1,000 specially selected pioneers, they will travel far beyond the solar system to the planet next one and establish on that planet a permanent base, a new home for humanity. Alexandra Duchamp Sonsino, thanks to your amazing achievements in the realms of the Internet of Things, innovation culture and technology thinking, you have been selected to be among those first 1,000 pioneers. But before you board the spaceship that will take you to your new home, 
there are five key questions you need to answer. Are you ready, Alex, for those five questions? I am. Okay, great. And question number one is this: Name one luxury physical object that you would like to take to your new home. I'm going to say my cafetiere. Your cafetiere. I mean, perfect coffee. Right, you're going to need that, especially in the morning, on this new planet. However long the days are, we don't know. Question、Assuming、number two. Assuming I can grow coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Question number two. Name a book everyone should read before they board the ship to take this journey. The Pursuit of Loneliness by Philip Slater. Okay, tell us a tiny bit about why. Uh, it's a nineteen seventies nineteen eighties book on.、Uh, it's a sociology slash philosophy book. It's wonderful. So you think it will lead to a kind of more enlightened society on next one? Yeah. Great. Okay. Name one exceptional person who should be among the first one thousand pioneers to go to next one.、Uh, Dr. Pierce Gordon. Again, tell us who is a researcher,、uh, researcher and、um, designer working between Africa and the United States, and does wonderful work、uh, questioning the power structures behind design work. Fantastic, thank you. Okay, question number four: Name a law that bans something from next one forever.、Uh, Single-use plastics. Done. They are gone. No single-use plastics on next one. Finally, question number five: Name a tradition from planet Earth that you would like to see replicated in your new home on next one. Dancing. Perfect. Great answer, Alex. Thank you so much. Prepare to board the ship. Take your cafe tier with you by all means. I think that's a that's a brilliant answer to that question. And thank you so much. Much more importantly, for joining us on the next show, you've been a fascinating and very enlightening guest. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being our guest today, and thank you for watching. Also, I would love to thank our partners, Accenture Song and Factor Drive, for their support. If you would like to meet us in real life, simply apply for a ticket for the next conference in September and join us there in Hamburg. I hope to see you there. Bye bye.